Okay, so I'll stand over here so we don't okay. have the echo feedback. So maybe we'll go ahead and uh, get started. It's uh, what time is it? It's seven. Seven. Seven or s oh seven. No, seven or four. I have. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started um, since I have a little intro to read anyway and so in that time people can continue to trickle in. Uh, welcome everyone to the Asia Art Archive um, uh, for tonight's talk uh, on Gendai Shicho Sha Bikako, um, an alternative art school founded in Tokyo by the publishing house um, Gendai Shicho uh, Cha Sha and whose experimental phase ran from 1969 to 1975. Uh, I'm John Tain. I'm head of research here uh, at the Asia Archive, and it's my distinct pleasure to welcome um, Yoshiko Shimada, who will be the speaker tonight. Uh, this program grows out of conversations here at AA concerning artists' involvement with alternative forms of pedagogy and the desire to research more into the conditions and context in which artists became interested in education as a form of social engagement. Uh, indeed, since the start of the 20th century, when artists and writers such as Annie and uh, Josef Albers and Vasily Kandinsky taught at the Bauhaus in Germany, Kasimir Malievich uh, Lubov uh, Popova and Alexander Rochenko at Vukhtimas in Soviet Moscow, and Rabindranath uh, uh, Tagore established a Pavan Bhavana at Santi Niketan in West Bengal, India. Uh, the setting of the school and the role of the teacher has been a very active site of investigation and action for modern artists and writers in their quest to reshape and reform society. The history of contemporary art is no less replete with artists whose uh, practices have been inextricably intertwined with their pedagogical commitments. One need only think of the conceptual artist John Baldessori or Michael Ash, or a uh, founder of Institutional Critique and both associated with the experimental art program at CalArts in the 60s and 70s in Los Angeles, or more recently, the relationship between artists such as Ai Weiwei and Hito Sterl at the Universität der Kunst in Berlin, or Willem de Roy and Hegu Yang at the Städelschule in Frankfurt, uh, to take a couple of ex examples in which the cutting edge status of these artists' work goes hand in hand with the experimental atmosphere of these legendary campuses. Indeed, AA's own research collections reflect the important space offered by the educational setting for artistic thinking and intellectual discourse. And this importance becomes clearer with the distance of time, if not before. This phenomena can be found in the papers, for instance, of Jyoti Bhatt, Aratan Parimu, uh, Gula Muhammad Sheikh, and K.G. Subramanian, uh, which document the rise of the Faculty of Fine Arts in Maharaja Saraj uh, Rao, University of Baroda, as a center of artistic development India, or Salima Hashmi, whose presence at the National College of Arts in Lahore contributed to its place in Pakistan. Um, so tonight, uh, uh, Yoshika Shimada, uh, whom we are very fortunate and honored to have as an artist in residence here at Asia Archive, will be speaking about this phenomenon in the case of Bikako. Uh, Shimada is herself a product of uh, Bikako. Uh, she emerged from the school in the 1990s. And um, she lives and works in Chiba, Japan. She graduated from Scripps College uh, in the United States in 1982 and received her PhD from Kingston University, London in 2015. Her artwork explores themes of cultural memory and the role of women in the Asia Pacific War. Her work has been exhibited both nationally and internationally. In recent years, Shimada has been researching post-1968 art and politics in Japan. She has curated exhibitions such as Anti-Academy at the Jan John Hansart Gallery in 2013, Nakajima Yoshio Syndrome um, in 2015, and From Nirvana to Catastrophe uh, 2017, for which she wrote and edited the catalogs. She is currently working on the Matsuzawa Yutaka Archive in Nagano, and serving as director of the Matsuta uh, Matsuzawa Yutaka Sai Room Foundation uh, she lectures on Japanese art and politics of the 1960s and 70s and art and feminisms in Japan at the University of Tokyo. So please join me in welcoming Yoshika. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jong, and thank you very much for uh, um, AAA for inviting me here. I'm having a really great time, and I show you some findings from the archive later in my lecture. 
Uh, but in today, I'm, uh, I'm talking about, again, Daisho Shabigakko, which may not be, uh, you may not be familiar with, but this is a Japanese uh, alternative art school started by this uh, radical uh, left-wing publishing company, Gendai Shosha, and it started in 1969. And the 1969 is the year, this, this is Tokyo University Yasuda Lecture Fall that was uh, occupied by uh, the student organization, uh, Todai Zen Kyoto, and that its occupation fell in the January 1969. So this is the beginning of the end of the, the radical movement in Japan. And the Gendai Shosha Bigakko, that's in existence since 1959, they are very popular among these radical students because they, they, they published uh, the books by Trotsky, uh, that's one of the, their best sellers in 1960s, and uh, Rosa Luxemburg. But apart from those radical left wing uh, political books, they, in the beginning, they, they published uh, the, the books, the two books they published uh, the first. One was uh, the Actual Problems of the Communism by Henri Lefebvre, uh, the French philosopher, and uh, 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 um, Eugene by Malkit de Sade, that uh, the, um, is translated by Shibusa Tatsuhiko. And the, the, the founder and director of Gendai Shosha, Ishii Kyoji, said Lefebvre and de Sade and, and André Breton were the main pillars of the early days of Gendai Shosha. And Ishii regarded the publication of, uh, of these books as an attempt to destroy both Stalinist communism and modernist intellectuals using imagination as a weapon. And also uh, after, uh, oh, also this, this one, uh, uh, he, they published Shibuza translation of the Ju Juliet by Marki de Sade, and which was promptly banned as a pornographic by the Japanese court. And they went through the 10 years uh, battle case and uh, in after 10 years, 1970, both Shibuzawa, the translator, and the publisher, Ishii, were found guilty. But this, this uh, case put the uh, Gendai Shosha in spotlight and they got quite popular among the young people. And 1967, the Kawani Hiroshi uh, editor joined Gendai Shosha and uh, they published since then uh, more art related public books, such as this one is Nakamura Hiroshi's monograph, Boen Kyo Kara no uh, Kokuji, the announcement from the telescope. And uh, this is uh, on the right hand side, it's Karajuro's. Uh, uh, Karajuro is the director of the Situation Theater, also known as Red Tent Theater. The, the Red the Situation Theater is one of the first. Uh, the, the underground theater that went out outside of theater. They pitched at their huge red tent in, in various places unannounced or, uh, and has sometimes got into trouble with police. But uh, this Koshimaki Osen is uh, uh, his first publication of his plays and essays. And on the left hand side, that's Kamaitachi. Uh, that's a very well known photo book by Osoe. Eiko Hosoe, uh, e Hosoe Eiko, the photographer, who is also known as uh, photographing Mishima Yukio. But this one, Kamaitachi, is published in 1969, was that of uh, Hijikata Tatsumi, the, the, the leader, the founder of Ankoku Buto uh, dance in Japan. So they published these books in the uh, late 60s. And so the year 1969, as I said, in January 19th, Tokyo University, yes, the whole occupation ended. And on the same year in September, Red Army faction was formed. So up until then, that there's the more kind of ordinary students, bodies, that, uh, group occupied and barricaded themselves. But most of those barricades uh, are crashed and then the occupation end was ended by 1971, so many of the, some, some of the students, many students just gave up and went back to, to normal campus life, but then some, like those uh, Red Army factions, they took uh, uh, up uh, the, uh, the weapons and the, the more armed struggle line. 
So this is 6970 is the year that stu radical student movement uh, changed uh, quite a bit. So, but in general, there's a stagnation of political thought and activism. This, this armed struggle line was not that popular amongst almost all the, the students, so that, that, that many students just, just left the movement. Um, but so in, in facing this stagnation, she found the possibilities in art and education. And he tried anew the idea of nurturing autonomous mind, uh, this time not with political theory and lectures, but with art and physical work. Nakamura Hiroshi is one of the, the artists who uh, taught there at the Bigakko, and he said this in interview. I think Ishii tried to challenge the post-69 situation by reintroducing art as a tool for quiet reflection on the internal and for changes from within. From the beginning, I think she considered Bigakko not just as an uh, institution for art, but also as a movement where political and artistic activism, thoughts and philosophy were discussed, uh, practiced and realized. At the time when everything seems to be sliding down into the bottomless void, we at the Bigakko dare to dig our heels in to stop and think inwardly. So that the Radical Publish Company was starting an art school, and this was uh, the major event for the young uh, leaders of Gendai Shosha Books. And this is the, the f uh, their first uh, the poster. It's quite a large silk screen poster. It's designed by uh, Nakamura Hiroshi and Nakanishi Natsuyuki. And Bingakko literally means B. B is beauty and Gakko is school. But then uh, by this time, Gakko was not uh, uh, very much favored term uh, for the era of student revolt. Schools were to be destroyed. But then Bigakko dared to call itself Gakko, even though it was not even that government start certified school. It, it never had been, it, it never, it's, it's not. Um, it's intended to bring back the idea, it may sound anachronistic, but uh, of a school as a place of direct, intense interaction between teachers and students. Uh, in the 1969 inaugural brochure, Kihon Rinen, the basic principles, was set out as Bigako's curriculum uh, is primarily concerned with tewaza, te as a hand, waza as a technique or work, uh, work or craft. And also training through close relationship between teachers and students and students are to acquire the teacher's aesthetic ideas. And they said, uh, if we found no appropriate teachers, there will be no class. <laughs> so uh, it's the, okay. So the Biakov opened the pilot program in February 1969 with two workshops, the paintings by Nakamura Hiroshi and uh, drawing by Nakanishi Natsuyuki, each with 15 students. And in September of that year, Bigako opened other technical <laughs> workshops, design, wood carving, and mask making, miniature drawing, copying of classic artwork, uh, artworks, perspective drawing, and pen drawing. And in April 1970, art workshop class was added it was taught by three teachers in rotation, Akasegawa Genpei, Kikuhata Mokuma, and Matsuza Yutaka. So these five uh, artists, uh, Nakanishi, uh, Nakamura, Akasegawa, Kikuhata, and uh, Matsuzawa, are the, uh, the, the subject of my um, work. Oops. Oh, what did I do? Uh, and this is uh, the, uh, the photograph of the, the workshop uh, in 1971. This is quite large, one floor uh, classroom divided by those curtains and it, it was uh, covered with 80 tatami, 
mat, tatami is a straw mat. So the students and, and, and teachers sat or even lie down on the floor, and they have these boxes that was designed by Nakanishi and Nakamura as workbenches. And, in, and uh, this is an one uh, of the example of hand, hand te tewaza, handwork. This is a sample of, of uh, wood carving models. This is very quite old-fashioned one uh, taught at the, the wood carving class. So the class was structured. Uh, there's morning lectures uh, and uh, uh, afternoon classes, artist workshops, and craft workshops. So the, they have the classes only once a week, but then uh, afternoon classes are from one o'clock to nine o'clock. And very often they went to have dinner together, went drinking, or s you know, so it, it just really continued until midnight or maybe even next morning. So the uh, these lectures, this is Tanemura Suehiro, that the German symbolist uh, scholar, uh, were held in the morning. And some of the lectures, uh, Shibusawa Tatsuhiko's uh, the theme, the era civilization, end of the world. Tanemura is uh, the alchemy, Akiyama Kiyoshi, is, he's, he's uh, the poet about anarchist poetry. Uh, Iwaya Kunio, he's a shu about surrealism. Karajuro, the theater person, uh, it's Kadan show or no, no theater. And Matsuyama Shuntaro, he's an Indian philosopher who passed away recently, but he's uh, talk about Indian symbolism. And Hijikata, the Buto dancers, his Nyuktairon, the, the theory on the body. So all these, uh, the scholars and artists, it was quite rare for them to have any public lectures. So actually, there are several students uh, later told me that they, they joined Bigako only to, to listen, attend these lectures. So this, uh, okay, before we go to each class, I just want to, to talk a bit about concept of tewaza, this, this uh, the hand technique. And, um, one of the key concepts of Bigako was the emphasis on tewaza. Although this may appear rather an outdated idea, it was precisely what was missing in Japanese art academies uh, those days. I interviewed an artist who attended the National Academy of Art, Geidai, from uh, late 1950s to 60s, and she said there was not much of the, the, the technical training at the, the Geidai then, apart from like Greek statue drawing in charcoal. And otherwise, they are supposed to develop their own things, but there was not even close communication with professors, and there was almost no theoretical discussion. Uh, but Bigako was, uh, but the emphasis of Tewaza Bigako was, it was not that they are just supplementing what was lacking in academy. What Bigako aimed for uh, with their in insistence on Tewaza was to uh, consciously go against the modernist current in search of the radicals in the world's original sense of root and this uh, primary energy from which revolutionary creation could be born. What Ishii saw in Tewaza was not merely the pursuit of good artisan skills, rather he thought of it as a tool for acquiring embodiment the understanding and realization of ideas through rigorous disciplines, physical ex experience. The Okada Tatsuhiko, an art critic who visited the first year class of Bigako, noted there was a sense of ethics in their attitude towards art. He wrote, uh, their emphasis on the, un uh, on the universality of handwork skills may remind some of Bauhaus but the atmosphere of Bigako reminds me of the art and craft movement of William Morris. Not in the superficial similarity, but in their attitude. Morris' ideal was not just making good product, but changing the society through development of an art that was an expression of the pleasure of labor. 
and how the concept of tewaza should be interpreted and realized in practice was up to each teacher. The artists who had atelier classes came up with their own unique curriculum. And Bigaku administration did not choose teachers who suited the idea of tewaza or tried to force it as a fixed methodology but chose ones who could bring interesting interpretations of it. And these different elements were to collide and generate energy and intensity. So these each, I will explain each classes. The, the first one was Nakamura Hiroshi. <coughs> the Nak this is him when he was young. Uh, Nakamura Hiroshi is a painter who is probably best known of uh, his, his works in during 1950s of the uh, so-called reportage paintings. This was uh, the paintings uh, of this particular one. It's called Sunagawa Goban. He uh, went to, this is about uh, the uh, American military base expansion on Sunagawa, Tachikawa, and this crash between the, the farmers and uh, uh, the police, Japanese police. So reportage painting was that the artists were sent there to the site of the struggle and make paintings. And sometimes they are called social realism, but uh, it, it's, he's, he's uh, from the background is more surrealism. So it's, it's different from uh, kind of Soviet uh, social realism. But uh, uh, later in 60s, he's, he's uh, uh, more, um, well, still realism, but more towards surrealism. So Nakamura, his painting workshop, uh, he adopted a kind of classical oil painting techniques such as grisaille, chiaroscuro, and sfumato. Those are kind of Renaissance, uh, very old Italian classic uh, technique. So it sounds like it's, it's, it's very much traditional for the Westerners. Um, but Nakamura's intention was to use Western classic technique as antithetical to the modernism that dominated Japanese art academies. Nakamura said that the, since Western art was introduced in the 1870s to Japan, the Japanese had always loved expressionistic paintings in which artists poured out their inner sentiment in bold strokes, heavy texture, and atmospheric colors. A few artists tried to establish realist paintings as genre in Japan, but had not succeeded. Well, that's his uh, uh, opinion. And without a strong realist tradition at the, at the core, as there was in Europe, Japanese modern art has nothing to either build on or level against, only shifting from one style to another. So Nakamura was uh, trying to introduce uh, realism technique in uh, to his student um, by uh, intru uh, um, introducing kind of classical training. But as uh, this was only like one year, later Nakamura's class was extended to two years, but then it's, it's difficult to, to train the student in this classical training in one year, especially that Bigako attracted lots of students who were not uh, really um, art student. Some, some were graduated from like National Academy, but many of them dropped out from universities. Like Nakamura said one of his students was, was a female student from Tokyo University who were actually in that the Yasuda lecture hall. So um, in order to give them some technical um, skill, he, what he did was Copying this was uh, this particular one. This is student work who had not not much uh, previous training. Uh, this is uh, to copy a black and white photograph of Mona Lisa with pencil, but he gave a student pencil with with exposed lead like ten centimeter, and it's it's very hard pencil, and he uh, told them there's a very strict set of how to do this. Uh, they are supposed to start f with right eye from the detail. So, in, in because in Japanese uh, academic training, uh, we are all to do that the Greek statue drawing uh, with charcoal, but we are supposed to start from the, the large, you know, uh, the form. 
and then go into detail. No, he said that's much easier to just from start from detail and establish the right eye and then from there it just extend so that uh, you don't make that much mistake. And that's truly like some, some many of the students, they can get up to certain uh, uh, technical uh, um, ability uh, doing this. So, uh, and also for the, the, the theme, uh, each student was requested to make memory book about his or her own life experience uh, using writing, drawing, photograph, or combination of these. And th so the theme is contemporary and personal. And then technique was, is uh, a realistic one. So uh, for Nakamura, a painting should come out of the conflict between outside the political objective and inside the personal and subjective and establish itself as an autonomous entity independent of even the artist himself. So this is that the painting is something of the kind of battlefield of inside and outside. And these are some of the, the, the paintings by uh, his students. And then another one, the same year, is Nakanishi Natsuyuki's atelier drawing class of the rotating portrait project. And Nakanishi Natsuyuki is probably the best known uh, outside Japan as uh, the, the member, the center of the highlight center. He later became uh, the painter but well, he started out with painting and then he did like a uh, highlight center and then he came back to painting. So his rotating portrait project is that it's formed five groups of consisting of three students and they each draw each other's portrait and their own self portrait. So there'll be nine portrait. And, uh, but then each class period contains some kind of performative exercise uh, that I it think it's, it's influence of Buto dance because Nakanishi, before this, around uh, the late 60s, had he has been collaborating with Hijikata Tatsumi. This is 1968, Hijikata's uh, Niktai no Hanran, the revolt of body. And this, this uh, um, the metal sheet is and uh, the, uh, the, the theater, the setting is done by Nakanishi. So at this time, he was collaborating with, with uh, uh, Buto dance. And uh, he said in an interview that uh, he thinks that, that the artist as a teacher was akin to choreographer or a theater director. So what he did in the class, uh, he gave this kind of diagram of each week and it's, think, think it's class start with, as I said, some kind of uh, the exercise. Uh, like there's four sh students in the corner with with transparent round thing in front and then they get together in the middle of the room. This he said, Nakanishi explained, was to feel uh, uh, the physically um, feel or uh, find about the space. And then this one also, this is to, um, this is that another exercise of, of two students facing each other and put the finger in each other's mouth and then uh, make drawing of that uh, feeling. Because this is supposed to be a portrait painting, but then before starting portraiture, uh, he has, he told the student, you have to establish what the face is. So the void inside the mouth, is that the face? Or is that the space, outer space or inner space? So another exercise was he made the student drink, eat and uh, eat something and drink milk and had the fear of things going down your throat. And you have to decide where the face and, and where the throat start, that kind of thing. So. Um, yeah, actually, I think they spend more time doing this kind of exercise uh, than uh, the making drawing itself. 
And this is another one. They are uh, looking. Uh, this he didn't explain uh, very much, so I'm not really sure. But then I they had the, the mirror in front of them, but then there's the triangular shape was cut out or out that uh, the back of the mirror was scraped off the triangular shape. So you can see yourself, but you can see others through this this triangular shape. Um, then you are supposed to compose that portrait of yourself and others. So this is really, I mean, the title of the class sounds very simple, the portrait of, of drawing class, but then actually this is really far from uh, uh, ordinary drawing class. And these are some of the, the, the student work. I'm not sure which one this is, like um, maybe inside the, the mouth. <laughs> no. <laughs> and this is uh, uh, looking uh, there's there's some device to look yourself from your back, and this is uh, yeah th this is the the finger in the mouth thing. So they each made uh, had the the uh, sketchbook, and then there's some sometimes there's writing by Nakanishi. And this, and then this Akasegawa Genpei, Akasegawa's class. Uh, this is 1967. Well he started the, the class in 70s, and uh, around this time he was doing kind of book illustrations, etc. But uh, this is post Highlet Center. He was also the member of Highlet Center, and he uh, in 1966 he got uh, there was a famous uh, court case of 1,000 yen bill case. He made a copy, not copy, he made a model of 1,000 yen bill, uh, and then he was prosecuted for that. And uh, that the court battle was again like 10 years, and he was found guilty at the end. But he was so much involved in this, and he was not really um, making uh, much of artwork at this time. So this is uh, a bit later, but this is his, his uh, zero yen uh, bill. He thought, oh well, making that the model of 1,000 yen is a crime, so he would just make zero yen bill. <laughs> and then he was to, in the beginning, he was exchanging this to, to 300 yen. Mm -hmm. Now it's cost more, but then his, his plan was to exchange this zero yen to uh, Japanese yen. So eventually the Japanese yen will disappear and it all becomes zero yen. <laughs> And this is a, a part of the, the exercise and uh, his class. He told students, in this case, they are inc uh, including some of the, the very well-known artists, they told students to, to draw 1,000 yen bill without looking. And then these are uh, done by some artists, like Nakamura Hiroshi and that's Araki on the, the, the bottom one. Uh, but these are by students and other people. They cannot draw. I mean, you, you can try. I, I did this in my class too, and they cannot draw. They cannot remember. But uh, every day we, we saw them and we used them. When we use them, we can tell if that's fake or not. But then when you're told to, to draw it, it's, it's really, really difficult. Um, and the Kimura Takehisa, the, the graphic des designer who also taught at Bigako, he, he uh, asked about this exercise. He said that, that the paper currency was symbolization of the state, and they designed the bon banknote with its intricate uh, geometric patterns to discourage counterfeit, and with juxtaposition of various images, images to abstract the state function to inactivate people's imagination of the state. So yeah, it's, this is an uh, uh, exercise to realize that how much your imagination of suppressed uh, by this state. <laughs> okay. And then this another one is Kikuhata Mokuma. Kikuhata is a well-known uh, Japanese painter. He was a uh, member of Kyushu Ha. Uh, the group uh, was uh, active in, in Kyushu, the southernmost island in 19, uh, from the 50s to, to 60s. And Kikuhata's workshop, oh, this is Kikuhata's work, uh, Slave Genealogy in 1961. 
Uh, this is remake, I think. Uh, it's in now in the collection of Contemporary Art Museum in Tokyo. But his uh, exercise was, was uh, uh, making copy of Yamamoto Sakubei's coal mine paintings. This Yamamoto Sakubei is, uh, he, he's, he's even this time, he was, I think, over 60 or 70. He was ex coal miner, and he, this after his retirement, he started painting his, his life with uh, all these writings and uh, how much, you know, how, how he, he, he lived and worked. And it, Kikata at this time was quite, quite obsessed with Yamamoto's coal miner paintings. So um, he decided he will make, um, yes, the class description is this class aimed to produce a large scale mural based on about 400 co uh, pieces from over a thousand artworks by Yamamoto Sakubei. Uh, so they will to copy them on this, uh, I think eight or nine, two, uh, uh, two meter by four meter canvas in oil. And this is what the uh, Kikata said about Yamamoto Sakubei's hand. Uh, the, the hand that held the pickaxe was now holding a paintbrush and painting the scene of his holding a pickaxe. Sakubei said he could not paint well but he has something so much bigger and deeper. His paintings are pregnant with universality. The value of these paintings lies in their lack of technique in an ordinary sense. So he made a uh, student to make exact copies of, of uh, the, this kind of rather, we, they say, primitive uh, drawings in oil. And there are several pictures of them. So they, um, they made kind of um, design of these uh, uh, the compilation of drawings on several canvases. And here is uh, Kikuhata work and the students. And so you see the scale of that, the canvas. They are quite large. And this, these are uh, s one of those, I think, nine uh, canvases. Now they are donated to the, the library in Kyushu, uh, Tagawa, Tagawa City uh, Library. Oops. And this is another one. So each of them has, uh, um, yeah, each, each canvas has, I don't know, about like 50 um, paintings, uh, the drawings compilation. And then another one is uh, then the last one is Matsuzawa Yutaka. Uh, the, the class title is The Final Art Thought. Uh, and he taught there from 1971 to 80. The Matsuzawa is known as a forerunner uh, that or the father of, of uh, Japanese conceptualism. And uh, as, uh, as, as John said, I am doing uh, now trying to, to uh, make archive from his house. This is uh, in uh, the attic of his house called Psy Room, in which he accumulated his works and, and uh, materials, uh, other people's work, etc., from 1950s on. I mean, he uh, officially he said, like, in, in from 1964, he decided not to make any artwork, and then from then on, he just made conceptual art. But actually, he did make some things even later on, and he did not discard anything. So this is a quite small room, but this, uh, this all these things accumulating and collecting dust. Uh, some years ago, this, this was, uh, they attempted to recreate this room for Yokohama Torai Annual, but they, of course, they couldn't recreate this. They just pick up some stuff from out there and then displayed. And so this is still in existence in Suwa, uh, Nagano. Okay, so Matsuzawa's final uh, art thought studio, um, is, uh, this is a description of the class. As I have been warning since 1961, the ignorance and mistakes of modern civilization have become increasingly evident. In the most sensitive area, a brave change of direction has started. 
if this misguided civilization can't change direction towards the natural within, this century and uh, the humanity will be extinct by the year 2222. He has this obsession with numbers, especially number two, because he was born in 1922, uh, February 2nd. <laughs> 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 so, so he said, we will develop the final art by mixing and changing the following 27 elements in each unit. So these, to these are 27 elements. So there's post-minimalism, creation, the eros, the uh, hippie, LSD, anarchism, freedom, utopia, uh, secret societies, uh, uh, chain poetry, etc., etc. So um, this workshop has possibility of becoming the last lasting commune of art thought, or of, of uh, participating in other communes of the same kind. So Matsuzawa at this time, and in early 70s especially, he had the uh, kind of communal, imagined commune with his artist friends and had several exhibitions uh, titled Nirvana, etc. Um, so this uh, eclectic mix of topics, uh, uh, so this is a workshop has, actually this workshop has uh, absolutely nothing to do with Tewaza or handicraft. <coughs> he must not discourage students to make any artwork. So the class was to uh, it, uh, consist of discussion, uh, the reading materials, and then uh, uh, yes, yeah, so just people expressing their ideas in language, but not in any kind of art form. Some exercise he did was his, uh, this he did several, um, this is silk screen of white circle, and he, which he called ultimate painting or that uh, uh, fundamental painting or something. So he um, makes students cut out these white circles and then paste them on, on pages of magazines. That kind of exercise he did, but then it was not to produce artwork per se, but then some kind of mental exercise. So these are the, um, the five classes of Bigako. And that, uh, apart from Matsuzawa and, and, and uh, Akasegawa taught there like five years, but uh, also hmm, like uh, Nakamura, maybe five years, but Nakanishi only taught there uh, the one or two years. And then um, the from the beginning, Ishii Kyoji said he did not intend Bigako to last very long. Uh, he said no more than two or three years. He knew that the fundamental conflict would inevitably arise between the collective organization, which is school, and the uh, autonomous individual who are its students. And also financially, uh, in the beginning, Bigako was doing pretty good. They got all the students, and uh, uh, but then also they are selling uh, their books quite well in early 70s. But then towards the, the mid 70s, um, that there's the drop of sales of Gendai Shosha books because I think people are not tending to to read very political or uh, difficult books which they published. So um, by 1975, uh, they are in pretty bad shape financially, so they pulled out from that uh, operation of, of Bigako. Uh, but then they continued, so that the, big, the school called Bigako still is in, in existence in Tokyo, in Jim, the same place in Jimbocho. They use the same logo, same uh, posters, but then it's really not Bigako. It's uh, that the principle is totally different. Uh, so I specifically said it's uh, I'm researching Gendai Shosha Bigako because after 75, it's, it's actually totally different school, I think. So the if Bigako is relevant to the current situation in Japan, it is not because it can provide useful models or methodologies to solve the stagnation. On the contrary, it is Bigako's refusal to being effective, rational, linear, and comprehensive 
and the determination to remain in the realm of chaos, contradictions, and unknowable, that brings about a necessary energy to liberate us from existence, ex existing constrictions. So that's about Bigakko, but then, as I said in the beginning, I want to really show you some of my, some of my findings from yesterday. Uh, so this, is, this was in uh, the Bigakko in 1969, and this is, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it in, in Japanese pronunciation, it's Soken Jikken Gakuin. Uh, this is a small brochure I found in the, the AAA uh, ha, ha, Harichon's uh, uh, archive. And this is a school, uh, this, is a, well, this is the only thing I found, so I'm not really sure uh, how long it lasted, but this is dated as 1968 and said that the uh, human beings need to be re-educated. <laughs> and this is experimental education. And this, this says it's, um, yeah, that's how you achieve it. I'm, 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 I'm just reading some, some Chinese character I can understand, but then this sounds very interesting. And also they are teaching that the Gendai Shiso, that uh, the contemporary thought. And these are some uh, teachers there. Some of them, I, 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 I today I, I went to meet um, Mei Fang, and she said some of them are very well-known artists now. And these, and then also there's a literature. Uh, they teach liter uh, art that is uh, paintings and drawings, and I think also printmaking, uh, sculpture. Uh, architecture, um, uh, li and film, maybe. Um, yeah, I haven't really gone through this, but it very, sounds very interesting. And even one of them, uh, he seemed to have gone to Kyoto University to study. And this is where it is located, and uh, that's the house. Uh, that's the school was housed. and. And then also, it's, uh, the brochure said they, they won't charge tuition to those who are not able to, to pay. So obviously, somebody was sponsoring this and was this radical experimental school. So if anyone in the audience know anything about this, I'm really, really uh, dying to know more about this school. So that's, that's my presentation. <coughs> Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Yushika, for that wonderful and fascinating um, uh, presentation. And I was wondering if maybe, you know, as a way of contextualizing the the subject of Igako, if could you talk a little about, you know, kind of the wider context of alternative art education mm -hmm. that forms a, you know, kind of um, the framework for your own research into this? Um, so that's one question. And yeah, you can start with that. Uh, at that time? Yeah, in the 60s and 70s, uh -huh. yeah. Okay, as I said, at the 60s, uh, in, in the 60s, there's, a, um, there's art academy, the national one, and as I said, it was more very much like modern art, but then it was not really well structured. I think that uh, from the beginning, Japanese art education was very problematic. As I said, it was that even the word bijutsu art was imported uh, from the, the Western concept. There was no word as a bijutsu in Japan before. It was the painting, the word for painting, etc., but not, not, not as fine art. So this, this idea of, of fine art and even teaching fine art was very new. Uh, and in the beginning, there was entirely imported idea, and they imported the, the, uh, the teachers from Italy. Mm -hmm. But then afterwards, they changed entirely, and they just brought in all the Japanese artists and put emphasis was on Japanese painting, the Japanese-ness, like Okakura Tenshin. Mm -hmm. And then after the war, it went back again to more kind of modern Western ideas. So this is Japanese Art Education Academy just going back and forth, it's, you know, the Japanization and the Western idea. And uh, we 
really did not have, as, as one of the, the ex-students there said, there was not much um, structure mm -hmm. in, in the education there. So on one hand, Bigakko tried to like, deny that the modernization and then try to uh, bring in this kind of unstructured structure from mm -hmm. like learning from the individual artists from their own practice. Whereas there was another one, um, um, uh, God, I forgot its name, I, I, I didn't forget, it's, it not. Uh, it's in Yokohama, um, Bizemi. It's a Bizemi in, in, was in Yokohama. And that was based on the American uh, met method. So it was so very well structured, only about contemporary art. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, well, in, in, in kind of uh, from outside, it kind of looked like Bigakko because it was alternative school. And it was each uh, class was taught by practicing artists. But they, had, they are trying to establish more kind of streamlined methodology mm -hmm. for art uh, student to, to become successful contemporary artist. Yeah. So there are several different things happening uh, around the, the same time in the 60s. Mm -hmm. But I think Bigakko one was, uh, I think it, it has, because of Hijikata and Karajuro, uh, lots of those underground artists in the late 60s are really searching for their roots. Uh, they're going back to pre-modern. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so their methodology, method they don't have methodology, but the, their, their philosophy was very different from Acad either the National Academy or Bizemi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, you know, during the presentation, I was thinking of um, one uh, artist who taught in the Japanese system mm -hmm. at this moment in the 60s, mm -hmm. and he himself had been trained in the Bauhaus system, which mm -hmm. really emphasized a kind of a lack of rules and kind of intuitive approach. Mm -hmm. And his comment was that he stopped teaching the system because he couldn't get Japanese students to, to, to do that. Oh. They just wanted a system of rules to follow, and then mm -hmm. they could, you know, so that they could succeed and kind mm -hmm. of, you know, very clear. Um, kind of guidelines mm -hmm. for how to succeed. And it mm -hmm. seemed like what was happening w in Bigako mm -hmm. was like in some ways they were trying to institute very almost like kind of like um, a parody of rules so that it's almost like you're going to follow these rules, but it's kind of leads you into this completely other place. Mm -hmm. It's like so kind of um, I mean almost like a kind of like a satire of it or something. Yes, yeah. because uh, the Nakamura-san said, Nakamura Hiroshi especially said he put the such a rigid uh, rules like mm -hmm. you are supposed to use this pencil, you do this and that, to in order for th uh, the student to rebel against. Yeah. I mean, he, the, the, he Nakamura said, especially for Japanese uh, children's art education, it's it's called jiu kaiga, the free painting. So the children should be like childlike and then do all this freedom, mm -hmm. but there's no structure. So uh, it's at, at the end, that all the children going to those children's art class making like childlike mm -hmm. like, and they all kind of uniform <laughs> you know <laughs> childlike paintings so Nakamura-san said no that, it, that, that the student needs structure so that they can you know, fight against mm -hmm. and then by fighting against but if, if you well some obviously some students just obey and try to be you know good at it but then many of them are dissatisfied mm -hmm. and then only from this uh, satisfaction you can find what you really like or your own voice. Mm -hmm. So in some ways it's kind of pushing at the kind of the, the desire for conformity mm -hmm. to, to its kind of limits in mm -hmm. some ways. Yeah, oh. yeah. so they have to break mm -hmm. from that uh, conformity. Yeah. But um. it was, it's really hard because some, some that, especially in uh, Nakanishi Natsuyuki's class, because it was so rigid but also so unusual, mm -hmm. uh, students really didn't understand <laughs> what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> but then they are so obedient. Like they, they all of them yeah. said that yes, they had to put the fingers yeah. in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but they are so confused. Yeah. So I think s uh, many of them just really lost. <laughs> yeah. So okay. Um, and you know, so you that's within the context of Japan, where there are exchanges because this was also a moment around the around the world when there were mm -hmm. student revolts and protests, mm -hmm. and also kind of. Um, turns towards alternative forms of pedagogy. Mm -hmm. So were there conversations or exchanges between Bigako and its faculty and uh, with you know schools uh, at other locations? 
Uh, no, not really. I couldn't find because uh, uh, this is uh, the catalog of Anti Academy. Uh, this this whole yeah. um, research started because the editor Alice Maud Loxby in in uh, London. She was she started this pr project about like researching. Uh, non-academic art academy, uh, art school in, in Europe. And then she came to Japan and asked me if there's anything like that. And uh, of course, there is a big akko. So we decided to do research together and then uh, had the exhibition called Ante Academy. And that's big akko and then uh, experimental school in Copenhagen and uh, uh, the Iowa one, what is it called? Um, it's part of the University of Iowa, but then the, this guy, the German guy, just did it, it, intermediate, intermediate in Iowa. So they are doing really similar things, especially like the experimental school in, in Copenhagen, Big Akko, it's all done by artists, but um, there's not that much communication. I don't think they even, no, I don't think they knew each other's existence. Although uh, the experimental school, had, uh, Pa Kyukubi was, was uh, one of the teachers, and he was a friend of Kosugi Takehisa, uh, the, the group Ongaku, he's a uh, uh, Japanese experimental um, the music mm -hmm. artist. And then also Kosugi later taught in from 1973, he taught a couple of years in Bigakko, but then in the beginning, I don't think there's no communication. It was just happening, the same kind of thing was happening simultaneously. Okay, so a lot of improvisation, mm -hmm. kind of. Okay. Um, do people in the audience have questions they would like to ask? There are a lot of photo snapping, so clearly <laughs> this. Thank you very much. Uh, would you tell me a little bit more about how the Gendai Shichosha Bigako uh, transitioned towards the current Bigako? Because you said that's 1975. Mm -hmm. Is it happened slowly, or is it just um, Ishii just decided to leave and uh, just take someone took over? Or um um, well, even before that, the uh, she uh, Gendai Shosha pulled out. The Nakamura Hiroshi said that the, the original principle was was, you know, great. But then uh, that was just very very difficult to um, realize. And as I said, that many of the students are a bit confused uh, because it was so unstructured. Um, and then some some so some teachers uh, remained, but then. After a while, uh, another person, Imaizumi Akihiko, he took over and he had more or less a uh, more traditional idea of art as kind of self-expression. So under his uh, di directorship, some of the more radical uh, artists like Nakanishi left and then Nakamura's class was moved to Saitama and also Kikuhata's class. And then he introduced more technical ones, like printmaking, more traditional ones. So yeah, and that was also for the school to survive because you know there's technic more technical classes, uh, they had more students. So it was not, um, already I think by uh, 74 uh, that, that there are changes within. And then with financial difficulty, again, they should have pulled out, and that was pretty much end of the, the first principle. Uh, how, yeah, it was great teachers, and then the, how was the outcome? How, who was the student? And it was any out, you know, any of the student become any artist mm -hmm. who was really went this through special education and. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, they didn't really produce any art trend or big <laughs> artists, you know. They said from BCME, they are more famous artists. But then, interestingly, they did not produce very famous uh, fine art artists, but then they are uh, well-known that uh, manga artist, And also, one of the, the, the student of Naka, uh, Nakamura's uh, draw, the, the, the Mona Lisa class was uh, Sanoshiro, who is now a very well-known actor. And he, uh, I also interviewed him, and he said uh, this, the interesting thing. He remembers the Nakamura Sensei telling him to start with just details, and also do not put anything unnecessary things there. Just, just 
you know, see the external and then just copy it. That's that's your task. And when he became an uh, actor, he was uh, he, he went into that uh, he was filming something and it's this famous director, I forgot his name, he said, you act, uh, you, you just read the line. Don't put in any unnecessary emotions or characters you <laughs> think, you know, this is not your, uh, as, as you really understand and read the, the, the line as it is said externally, that's enough. So, and, and so there's also uh, Minami Shinbo, he's an illustrator and the writer, he was uh, uh, the student of Akasegawa from the, the year 69, and he continued go taking his class like over 10 years. He just without payment, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> he became sort of his assistant, and now he's he's well known, um, the writer, illustrator. So, yeah, maybe he didn't produce like like big art star, but then there are uh, quite few people uh, in kind of subculture, but then now become more well known. They, 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 uh, each class was in the, the beginning, uh, the first year was limited to 15, and there's like 20 classes, including the technical. So it was like, uh, um, I think they, they tried to make it less than 300. And that's still pretty good. Yeah, that's, yeah but because they, the one class is, is only once a week, so they didn't have to have a whole bunch of people at once. But then later, I think that each class only had like five students. <laughs> and also that the tuition was quite high uh, because of this, this very close relationship with, with, with teachers. But also that the Nakanishi Natsuyuki said uh, that Ishii's intention was not just for students, but also the artists to survive. So uh, because the Akasegawa was right after the, the court case and he was not really doing much work and Nakanishi was in between of the Buto dance and, and the painting, so he was not really also uh, painting that much. So, but then she knew those artists and they, he wanted them to continue art practice. So they, Nakanishi and Nakamura both said that the salary, the first salary for the artist was really high, was surprising high, that was like, at that time it was like, Yonju ma, a month. So that's quite great amount of money. So, uh, so his intention was not just uh, for art education, but to to support the, those artists. Back here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm quite interested in that their curriculums, especially the emphasizing the uh, teachers. Mm -hmm. A student relationships and interactions, but I just wonder how much the teaching experience influence on the uh, each artist practice their own practice. Um, Akasegawa said uh, that it's 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 like he was sensei to like sensei but seito like teacher but also student because they he learned a lot from student because and and it was really unstructured and he was showing what he was doing and then getting the action from a uh, student. Also, he was at that time collecting the, the matchboxes and also later he did this kind of the thing called Thomason. They go around the, the town and then finding really strange architectures and things and then compiling them and he did with students. So, um, yeah, he said like student, he learned or they, they did some project very kind of collaborative way and also he uh, learned from student and also the other the, even the technical class uh, that the uh, okabe sans uh, the silk screen class the silk screen was relatively new technique then so the, the some of the student went into actually like some some photo lab or uh, the, the the factory to learn some something like photo techniques and then he brings that then to the class and then the okabe san that teacher learned from the student so it was not uh, uh, well it was as a principal that the, the students are to get everything from the teachers but then also the teacher was w or getting something from the students
on, but anyway, <laughs> I know that um, you are uh, have studied and or uh, feminism and mm -hmm. feminism is very important mm -hmm. to your practice, your personal practice as mm -hmm. well as your academic uh, research. Mm -hmm. um, I notice there's no female teachers no. in <laughs> this school. Um, how have you thought about mm -hmm. that as part of this research project? Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, could you talk a little bit more about mm -hmm. that? There was no big, uh, female teacher in Bigakko, even much later Bigakko. I think the first female teacher, I also taught there that the one class, uh, 2001, and I think that was around 2000 was the first time they, they, they had any female teacher. So this is also this, uh, the student movement and late 60s movement, radical student movement, it's very much male dominant. Uh, so they didn't have any you know, awareness of gender or feminism or anything, but actually uh, there are quite lots of students who are uh, uh, women, uh, I think more so than National Academy, but because still in, in um, late 60s, that, uh, I think there are more male students in Academy or universities than, than female. But this Bigakko, I think there are about one th more than one third uh, of a female students. And then I interviewed some of them, and especially that uh, one in Nakamura Hiroshi's class. And she said it was very interesting, this combination of, of uh, her personal, uh, this, this kind of personal uh, book thing she was to, to, to make for the class. And so she was, uh, in, in her uh, the book, private book, she was writing and making drawing a lot about her relationship with her father, and she made that into the big painting. So it's, it's almost like, and probably for her knowably, that was more almost like that, that uh, the feminist, uh, the, the, the saying, like the personal is political. And I think that in Nakamura's case, uh, I don't think uh, he was that much aware of feminism per se, but then his teaching and also his paintings, I, I didn't show, but he has large paint, his, his painting from uh, 60, late, mid 60s to 70s is all the school girl, that woman, the girls in school uniform, um, and then this, uh, my reading of the Naka Nakamura's painting is, is it's, it's very much of that uh, um, an empowerment of the, that very different way of depicting uh, Japanese woman's uh, body. So, and especially that, that com combination of the personal and political was uh, for me, that's very interesting from the feminist view, although they probably didn't think that was that way. Any other questions? Okay, well, if the no more questions, then I invite us to, you know, come and take a look at the book and maybe if you have, you know, individual questions, feel free to ask uh, Yoshiko. Uh, and thank you all for coming and thank you to Yoshiko for, for the talk today. Thank you very much.